Hello, 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 and welcome to episode 180 of Prog Review. And today I'm going to be talking about Metropolis Part 2 Scenes from a Memory by Dream Theatre. This one, this one here. Um, yeah, this concept album was has been requested a few times by, by you viewers out there. And so I, I bow to public pressure and cast my ears over the fifth studio album from Dream Theatre, you know. You see, you see it, bodes, it bodes badly, you know. It's, it's, they can't even spell theatre properly. I mean, you know, you Americans, you know, you're mangling of the English language. You know, there's a reason why it's called English and not Americanish. Yeah. So... Uh, Dear colonial cousins, please remember to refer to the Oxford English Dictionary to avoid any further confusion, you know, and it will avoid you making yourself look like a, a right bunch of proper wallies. Yeah? Now, Dream Theatre make that particular brand of music for people that don't actually like music. Yeah, These are the same people that don't enjoy humming a simple tune, they don't enjoy the, a, a sound of a child singing a nursery rhyme, or the birds singing in the trees. These people are the lowest of the low. They tend to be musical snobs who put one kind of music above another on a pedestal, and, and will tell you ad infinitum just how good this crap is, because it goes biddly bomb, biddly bomb, biddly bomb, biddly bomb, biddly widdly 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 bada 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 da 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 You get my drift. This is music for little boys, for prepubescents who haven't grown up or tasted their first woman. It's for those who lie in their parents' basements with their rush posters on the wall, listening to albums on headphones and nude, you know, nodding their heads, thinking that this is real music. But enough of my general loathing of dream theatre and the noodly convoluted testosterone fueled tuneless guitar drivel that they pedal. You're here for review. Well, you're going to get one. Yeah. Anyway, here goes. Um, this album was released in October 1999 and I, re I remember it well. I remember the time, the general level of interest it caused and the Associated Music Press, you know, reacted with various people throwing superlatives at this nonsense in an attempt to elevate it to some kind of artistic statement. I heard it at the time. I remember, I think I actually, yeah, I did. I, I bought a copy at the time. What was I thinking? What was I thinking? I went through a time where I tried to get through loads of different music, you know. I do try, you know. Um, yes, I bought it at the time, and I was unimpressed. I even bought the live album that came out in 2001. You know, the one that featured the Burning Twin? Yeah, I actually had that with the original artwork, and I sold it. It's probably worth a fortune now. Yeah? Uh, I was unimpressed with that either. So here we are, a third time. You know, I'm doing my best to wade through 80 minutes of musical slurry in an attempt to dive for pearls in this ocean of effluent wish me luck the album is the band's attempt to follow on from a song they recorded on their images and words album metropolis part one that makes sense isn't it? part one uh, the original was a sprawling cut and paste epic that deals with the alienation of the city and has enough double bass drumming on it to give a blue whale a migraine of terminal proportions it's typically charmless and clever, clever stuff from them, but you know it warranted enough attention from the fans to demand a sequel, and a sequel they got. In fact, the band delivered a whole bloody album of the rubbish. So, oh well, at least you know what's called Metropolis Part Two. Now you think they'd have just done Metropolis Part One again and and kind of. Oh, I don't know. So anyway, when you actually listen to the album, it begins with uh, the sound of a hypnotherapist and the ticking of a watch and he asks you to count backwards and if you've got any sense you should surrender to the void other than listening to the rest of the record you know or perhaps the hypnotherapist is is, is a cunning employee to hypnotize the listening to believing this is actually a good record yeah that could be it couldn't it yeah so anyway the album is divided into two acts and each act is divided into scenes of course, we called an act a side, and we called the scenes a song, and we'd all still be in the same boat. 
pretentious? No, this is art, I tell you. This is art. And it tells a story of some bloke called Nicholas who has various memories buried in his subconscious and, and he's, he's got a love affair. He's in, he's in love with a, a Victoria's Secret model or something. I don't know. The album, like it begins with like, oh, there's a fly in here. So even he knows the album is shit. There's, there's a fly. It's just the weather. I've got the back door open. Terrible flies. Weather, summer, isn't it? Summer, the sun's coming out. Look, can you see? Can you see? Anyway, the album begins like all good concept albums should, with an overture, back, you know, packed with musical themes that are to come. You know, and in in order to make this our, uh, this story a little bit more complicated, than it needs to be the lyrics are divided. You know, the opening lyrics are divided, and those are in the past, and those are in the present, and the ones in the past are marked out in italics. You know. And by doing this, you you instantly sense that everything's been deliberately complicated in order to validate itself and give it some sort of you know intellectual grounding, you know, and elevation. Strange deja vu sets the scene. It's half soft rock vocal and half widdly widdly. Look how well we can play, kind of thing. You know, unless you have the lyrics in front of you, it's impossible to follow what's actually going on. Uh, the band hit a mellow point with the ballad Through My Words, which you know is pleasant enough, but the breathy vocals and overall angst of the performance just puts puts me off. Puts me off, it does. Then Fatal Tragedy brings out the crunchy guitars and we're all placed in the middle of a murder mystery. Oh yes indeed. I think they should have actually called it Murder by Death. Such is its preposterousness. And then we head to Guitar Wankerville. Population? John Petrucci. It's really appallingly bad music. It is really, really bad. Meanwhile, Beyond This Life starts off at a blistering pace and then we have a spoken word narration of this murder-suicide that's gone on. Oh, it's a jolly little story, isn't it? You know? Teddy Bear's Picnic, isn't it? You know, Murder-suicide. Who'd have thunk it? The song is all double bass drums and thrumping. Thrumping. I've invented a word, thrumping. That's the sound that Dream Theater make. They thrump. It has a stop, start, quite loud. You know the usual cliches that you'd expect on this kind of nonsense. You know some of the acoustic guitar. You know it got me. I, I was just getting interested, and but just as my interest is you know peaked, Petrucci goes and wanks all over the fretboard again. He's a dirty boy. He really is. And we're back to the poodle hair, legs akimbo, rock mode. But, you know, at least 8 minutes 26 seconds in, Jordan Rudess, oh yeah, I've read, I've, read the, I've read the notes, employs the services of the studio cat to walk across the keyboard in a solo that is neither musical nor deliberately funny. But it did cause me to shout out, Get that cat off the piano! And other parts of me wanted to actually shout, Jazz Odyssey! Then we get to Through Her Eyes, and I reckon the band were probably scrabbling through their record collections to, you know, I wonder how they could polish this turd and what musical trickery they can steal from the heroes. And, and then one of them comes across, you know, Dark Side of the Moon, you know, and Claire Torrey's contribution to Great Gig in the Sky. But this breathy vocals and sub Gilmore guitar squawks, you know, it has lots of, oh yeah, oh yeah, I expect a hallelujah, praise the Lord, but didn't get any of that. And then the hi hats come in. I'm expecting, you know, like the tide is turning from Roger Waters instead, and we get another toothsome ballad as the protagonist sings about how oh, unfair this sad tragedy is. Petrucci, who was also responsible for the lyrics, and I suggest he either buys himself a thesaurus or learns that less is more when it comes to words. You don't have to keep fucking repeating yourself. But as the song goes on, you realise that, you know, this is the part. In, you know, in the concert, in the album, you know, if you if you're at the concert that you, that you raise your lighters aloft and you join the throng, this is the sad song. You know, this is this is the one. You know, it's the, this the emotional core of the album. So you better start fucking blubbing, boy. You better start crying for your life. Meanwhile, home. It's the name of a song on the album, part six or what is it? Yeah, part six. Well, that was good. Um, I have actually listened to this, it's hard to believe. Uh, it actually begins with some interesting Indian style riffing and percussion before the band ruin the atmosphere by squirting wah wah guitars all over the place. 
But despite an interesting start, it soon results that lumbering, chugging, thrumping you'd expect from a band with zero imagination. This is the band's version of White Lines by Grandmaster Flash and the Furious Five, but without the ha 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 ha. Uh, you know, and the humour, and the fun, and the tune. You see, because because the character's into drugs or something, or he's, he's addicted to something, and he's following the lines. Could be tram lines. Could be anything, really. <sighs> anyway, by this point in the album, you begin to wonder if some sort of chemical stimuli might get you through the ordeal. But, you know, the song you know, serves up another convoluted twist in the story, which by now I'd even I'd given up caring about. Who are these characters? Why should I invest my time into listening to them? They're either whining about something or dying by murder most foul. Sprawling isn't big enough a word to describe this mess. The Dance of Eternity is a spasmodic... Yeah, spasmodic? Yeah, yeah it's a word spasmodic instrumental that is so irritating I actually wanted to go off and punch myself in the throat by the end of it you know for putting myself through this nonsense now I've heard some of you you know some say that uh, you know Dream Theater are, are a melodic rock band you know they say that they, they use melody in their work well to them I say you know I hold up this song in particular and go go on go on whistle this you fucker I dare you go on go and whistle it you know it's stupid twitchy annoying guff for little boys with no hair on their balls. Now this leads us into One Last Time. The title of which echoes my feelings on the album. That this will be the one last time that I'll ever hear it. And then the breeze girly vocals kick in. And he's bleating on about that tragic ending again. I get it. The girl's killed. It's a tragedy. How many times do you need to hit us over the head with the T word? You know, they're trying to reinforce the melodrama by re repeating how terrible a crime this all is. This is terrible. It's a terrible, terrible tragedy. If you say it enough, we'll believe it. And that's what makes this utter nonsense and quite a demonstration of immature lyric writing. It is. You read it. It's just bullshit. Absolute utter nonsense. And don't even get me started on the spirit carries on because here the band just decided to rip off every Roger Waters ballad that's ever been written. And we have Le Brie. And you do know that Brie is a kind of cheese, you know. See, it all makes sense. All makes sense. You've got him breathing in at the mic about you know, one life and life's too short. Yeah, too fucking short to listen to this crap again. And the album ends fi with Finally Free. And yeah, I'm punching here. I'm finally free. Woohoo! Finally free. But, you know, even though I'm at the final track of the album, I've still got 12 fucking minutes of torture to go. And the final minutes are just that. A load of bombastic guff that just won't quit until we treat to some sound effects and the sound of the hypnotherapist knocking the needle off the record, which leads to an ultimately confusing end. It's a wafer-thin story, a love affair that results in murder, suicide, which may be replayed through the ages. You know, it's somehow spread over 70 minutes of diabolically bad music. The characters aren't even one-dimensional. They're merely names on a page. There's no drama. The band labours the point that this is a great tragedy to the point of ridicule. And yet somehow, in 2012, the readers of rollingstone.com voted this the number one prog rock album of all time over the likes of dark side of the moon and close to the fucking edge i mean come on i really fucking despair i really do this the greatest prog rock album of all time are you fucking kidding me Now, I'm sure, you know, the guys at Dream Theatre are lovely fellas. I'm sure, you know, they're nice blokes and they believe in the work that they, they do. And, you know, this is no slight on them. It's just this isn't the record for me. You know, this is entertainment. You know, what I do here is entertainment. This is no slight. I'm sure they're very good people. But this isn't, this isn't a great work of art to rival Dark Side of the Moon. Even they'd admit that. Come on, seriously. This is melodrama with a prog metal backing. And it's seriously awful. Now, in terms of rating, I'm going to be quite happy to give this one fatal tragedy out of five. That's one, 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 count them, 
Fatal Tragedy out of five. You people are bastards, you know that. Don't don't do this to me. You made me listen to this crap. This is just just awful, bad, bad stuff. Really bad stuff. But we're trundling through our concept album thread. I hope you're enjoying it. Sorry I haven't done many videos lately. I've been very ill during the week. And this is my attempt to revigorate and revitalise myself. Hope you've enjoyed it. Remember to leave your comments in the box below. Only nice comments though, you know, because the nasty comments about my personal appearance will get deleted and blocked. But yeah, feel free to debate the album in the comments box below and also leave any suggestions you might like to make. Um, also, you know, buy the album. You know, don't forget to buy the album or insert any album that I've got out at the moment because, you know, hard sell. Hard sell. This is a good concept album. This is better than Dream Theatre. Now I want to give this a chance though. Because I'm not bloody John fucking Petrucci. You bastards. But that's that. My name's been Darren Locke. I've been having an awful lot of fun with Dream Theatre. And I can't remember what the title is. Um, the, I can't remember my memories. Metropolis Part 2 Scenes from a Memory. It's a really good album for people who don't like music. And um, I'm sure you guys really love it. It's not one for me. I'm not sure what the next one will be. Should we make it um, Queens of the Stone Age? Yeah, that'll get me. That'll get me. That'll get me mojo back. Me mojo working. Queens of the Stone Age will be next with Songs for the Deaf. And you can all tell me how it's not a concept album. And I'll tell you how it is. And that's it. Only one more thing to say. Are you ready? Pin back your luggles, because here it comes. Prog on.